good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Paul Thompson, and I'm chairman and CEO of Country Club Bank. And on behalf of uh, our Thompson family, Country Club Bank, and Benedictine College, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank you for being here and welcome you tonight. The Thompson Medal Ceremony is a component of the Byron G. Thompson Center for Integrity in Finance and Economics at Benedictine College and was founded on my anniversary of my father's birthday, July 22nd, 2018. The Thompson Medal is indeed named in honor of our father, Byron, and is to be awarded annually to a person who demonstrates a commitment to integrity in their personal and professional lives, who has demonstrated notable professional skills and competence, who has made a significant contribution to finance, economics, banking, commerce, or entrepreneurship, and has made contributions to community life outside the bonds of their profession. These criteria certainly describe our honoree tonight, Michael or Mick Haverty. And we're thrilled you're here to accept it, Mick. You know, in creating the Byron G. Thompson Center for Integrity in Finance and Economics, it is our collective hope that the young men and women who are involved in the center at Benedictine College will emulate Byron Thompson. We hope that his legacy will serve to motivate and to inspire other Ravens to be faith-filled people of integrity whose own principal leadership will leave an indelibly positive impact on the world around them, not unlike the influence that Byron left on his family, his friends, his indus the industry, and the community. So it's now my pleasure to welcome the president of Benedictine College, who can tell you more about the college and tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming President Stephen D. Minnis to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be here. What a great night. What a fantastic crowd. Really appreciate that. I love the uh, adornment here. Uh, well, that's kind of a big banner, don't you think? <laughs> I've been uh, asking if they'll keep that up for a while. People from the plaza can see it here. Uh, it's really an honor to share the stage with such luminaries as the Thompson family, Mick Haverty and Esther George. Uh, thank you for your character and your commitment to the values that made this country great. So thank you for that. Mick, you're an inspiration to our students, uh, to the people in this room, and to me personally. And Esther, you're a model for what sound fiscal policy should be. Your fiscal philosophy always had Midwestern main streets in mind, and you never strayed from your strong roots. So thank you for your service. <laughs> Benedictine College is represented tonight by many here. Business School Professor David Geenans is the director for the Thompson Center. David uh, is here tonight. Thank you for being here. Also representing economics and, uh, I say finance, but I'm not a banker. I should say finance. So uh, <laughs> finance uh, are Dr. David Harris, uh, the chair of the economics department, and finance professor Brian Henry. So, Thank you all for being here. We have other professors here tonight as well, and we also have students who are Thompson Fellows uh, in uh, finance or economics majors. So thank you, students, for being here as well. I'm also I'm thankful to have former and current Benedictine College board members here. Can former and current Benedictine College board members raise their hand? Thank you guys all for being here. These are my bosses, so be nice to them. Say nice things about me. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you. It's clear that Benedictine College could not have better partners in tonight's venture and the overall Byron G. Thompson Center for Integrity in Finance and Economics than Country Club Bank and the Thompson family. I'd like to think that the focus on our mission and attention to community and faith, and in the case of the college, academic excellence, has led to the success of both Benedictine College and Country Club Bank. The college traces its roots to 1858, a time before Kansas was a state and the towns along the Missouri River were at the edge of the western frontier. You can imagine be being founded three years before the Civil War on the Kansas and Missouri border, right? Not a great place to start anything. 
But the monks were tough, okay? Wanted to start a school for the Lord's service. The college perseveres through the Civil War, the Spanish flu, two world wars, the Great Depression, the civil unrest of the 1960s, the financial burdens of the 70s and 80s, and coming back stronger every time by embracing our mission to educate our students within a community of faith and scholarship. This mission has led to a renaissance of late with record enrollment, uh, new buildings under construction, and national recognition. It is this commitment to the mission which makes partnering with the Thompson family a perfect match. The hope for this country lies in our young people, and Benedictine College, along with the Thompson Center, will equip, we, will equip graduates with the skills and undertake, understanding to take up leadership positions in society and help transform culture in America. One of those students who is benefiting from a Benedictine College education in the Thompson Center is here tonight. John Welty, a junior majoring in economics, Byron's major, and philosophy. So please welcome John Welty. Good evening, everyone. As President Minnis said, my name is John Welty, and I'm double majoring in economics and philosophy at Benedictine College. <laughs> When Byron Thompson graduated from Benedictine, then St. Benedict's, an all-male school in 1955, he wrote an editorial to his graduating class. And I'd like to share a passage with that with you all tonight. St. Benedict's, a liberal arts college, has given us the opportunity to become the well-rounded men of which it professes, persons that must attain to more than one maturity. Not only have we had the opportunity to gain physical, intellectual, emotional, and social security, the aims of every educational institution from the primary grade to the university level, but moral and religious maturity as well, the latter two being the most important of all. Byron Thompson recognized that there was something different about St. Benedict's, that it was not just another college in America. And when I first visited Benedictine 70 years later, I could tell that there was something different as well. My two older sisters both went to Benedictine, and when I visited them, I saw they were living in a community and making friends that I longed for in my own life. Friends that not only challenged them to academic excellence, but also friends that challenged them to live a morally mature life. Benedictine College is a chosen place, and it has given me opportunities that I could never have dreamed of. I was accepted into the Constitutional Fellows Program, and this program is preparing students for civic engagement to transform culture in America. I compete on Benedictine's moot court team, and my co-counsel and I were the first team in Benedictine history to go to nationals, where we compete against other schools like Yale, Georgetown, and the University of Chicago. I've had the honor of serving on the Campus Activities Board, where this year I was chair of homecoming. I was a bus captain last year on Benedictine's trip to the pro-life march, helping lead six buses full of students. And for two years now, I've had the opportunity to work at Raven Orientation Camp, or Rock Week. And this is one of my favorite times on Benedictine College's campus, because hundreds of students come together to help the next class of Ravens make the transition to college. And President Minnis tells me one of my favorite stories, where he tells the next class of Ravens that he's prayed for each one of them by name. Someone once told me, your success is built on someone else's sacrifice. And this is very true. I could not have made it to nationals without my coach, Dr. Kevin Vance. My economics advisor, Dr. David Harris, has gone out of his way numerous times to help me succeed, including recommending me for a scholarship. And I'm inspired by someone that I just met, Michael Haverty, and someone that I never met, Byron Thompson. These are two successful men of high character. And the number one reason that I chose to attend Benedictine was its commitment to living the Catholic faith. I could learn the theories of supply and demand from any college in America. But as Byron Thompson said, that would just make me a dangerous man whose education is incomplete. At Benedictine, we are taught the tools of the economic trade. But at the same time, we are taught Catholic social teaching that makes us morally mature. Pope John Paul II said, Marxism is not the answer. But he also said that free market mechanisms that become the only point of reference for social life is not the answer either. Instead, it is free markets and people of virtue that will make a successful society. 
At the Thompson Center, we are committed to fostering business practices that support the free market system that made this country great, rooted in faith and virtue. Byron Thompson is an excellent example of hard work and business rooted in virtue. And his legacy, both at Benedictine and in the world, makes me proud to be an economics major. Because 70 years ago, Byron Thompson realized that we needed to transform culture in America. And Benedictine College has continued this vision through its fellows programs and its academic excellence by staying committed to its mission of educating men and women within a community of faith and scholarship. Benedictine is producing the next generation of economic and business leaders that will enter the world not as men and women that are morally and religiously stunted, but men and women that are ready to transform the business world, just like Byron Thompson. Thank you for your support of the Thompson Center and the college. Good job, John. <clears throat> uh, John is most well known on our campus because he plays me in videos at the beginning of the year. You want to stand up and show him what you do in the video? You don't do much. Go ahead. I, I just have to point out. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Proud of you, John. He's just one example of the outstanding students we have at Benedictine College. They're truly making a difference in their communities and their workplaces in the world. So thank you. Each year, Benedictine College and the Thompson Center award the Thompson Medal to an individual who demonstrates a commitment to integrity, has notable professional skill and competence, whose achievements have made a significant contribution in finance, economics, banking, commerce, or entrepreneurship, and who exemplifies Byron Thompson's ideals. The recipient receives a medal cast with the likeness of Byron Thompson and has an endowed scholarship established at Benedictine College in the recipient's name, which is awarded to each year to a Thompson Fellow. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's recipient of the Thompson Medal, a leader in the corporate world of international transportation who certainly meets the criteria. Michael Haverty, or Mick as he is known in, Atch in his native Atchison, <clears throat> started his college career at Old St. Benedict's College, now Benedictine. He was educated by the Benedictines through grade school and high school in his first year of college, but when St. Benedict's dropped football, Mick moved on and graduated from the University of Louisiana Lafayette. He earned a, a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Chicago <clears throat> and returned to Benedictine in 2008 to receive an honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters. This, of course, surprised many of his friends, knowing of his competitive nature, because <clears throat> Mick was uh, very rarely wrote humane letters, is what they said. <laughs> He's a fourth generation railroader who began his career as a switchman and brakeman in 1963 for the Missouri Pacific Railroad in his hometown of Atchison, Kansas. In 1970, he went to work for the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, and he spent 21 years at Santa Fe and was elected as the young, one of the youngest presidents in their history in 1989. In 1995, he's recruited to run the Kansas City Southern Railway. And in 2001, he became the chairman, president, and CEO of Kansas City Southern. He retired from Kansas City Southern in 2015 after a 20-year career with the company. His roots have stayed at Benedictine, though, and he and his wife, Marlis, have been, the leading, have been leading donors to many projects. Today, one of the central buildings on our campus and a main gathering spot for students is the Haverty Center. He and his wife, Marlis, also funded the new baseball stadium at Benedictine College. This collegiate Gothic facility is named Olson Stadium after Marlis' father, Kenneth Olson, a former college teacher, coach, and Major League Baseball scout. To top off his love of baseball, Mick became one of the owners of the Kansas City Royals in 2020, so thank you for that, uh, Mick. He's been recognized in many ways for his leadership in both the business world and the community in general. He was named the Railroader of the Year in 2001 by Railway Age Magazine, Entrepreneur of the Year in 2008 by Ernst & Young, and Executive of the Year by the National Industrial Transportation League and Logistics Magazine in 2014. He entered the National Railroad Hall of Fame in 2012. It is now with great pleasure that we award the Byron G. Thompson Center for Integrity and Finance Medal to Mike Haverty.
Joe Biden. <laughs> That's right. So it's right here, we're going to get Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's going to be a very hard act to uh, follow with this young, handsome uh, Benedictine college student. Now you get to hear from an old railroad guy. So, uh, Anyway, I want to thank all of you for uh, being here uh, this evening. Uh, it certainly means a lot to me. And of course, uh, my wife, uh, Marlis, is uh, here of uh, 57 years. And two of our uh, children are here, and one of our uh, grandchildren at uh, our son was here earlier, but it is our granddaughter's uh, birthday, so it was more important that he take care of her than listen to his old man, which he yeah. uh, So uh, anyway, it's uh, great to see uh, so many people here and so many members of the uh, Byron Thompson uh, family and uh, so many other folks out here that are friends and acquaintances and people that I've known for uh, many, many uh, years and of course Esther George is going to be the keynote speaker tonight and I know that you came to hear her talk about uh, the economy so you really don't want to listen to much that I've got to say so <laughs> I'll try and keep it uh, uh, short here. Uh, first of all when uh, Steve Menace called me and asked if I would accept the Byron Thompson uh, medal uh, I didn't hesitate I immediately said that I would and under ordinary circumstances after being retired and spending two decades before uh, getting awards and serving on boards, uh, being honorary chairs and chairs of various events and so on, we've kind of turned those things down. But when it came to the Byron Thompson uh, medal, uh, I didn't hesitate. I uh, first met Byron in uh, 1995 when I came here as a uh, President and uh, C CEO of Kansas City uh, Southern Railway, and he was uh, recruiting the Haverty family to a bank at uh, Country Club Bank. And so I met with him. We immediately hit it off because we had a connection. He was from St. Joe and I was from Atchison, then the uh, Benedictine uh, connection. Uh, but it wasn't long uh, after that that I understood that Byron was not only a great business banking man but he was a great man. He was a very deep religious Catholic man uh, that uh, cared very, very much uh, about his family. One of the top family men that I've ever uh, met in my lifetime. Uh, we wanted him to go on the board of uh, Kansas City Southern Industries. He was kind of reluctant to go on a publicly uh, traded uh, company board. Uh, but when we spun off the financial assets uh, of Kansas City uh, Southern Industries back in 2000, July of 2000, he agreed to come on the board when I took over as chairman, uh, president, and CEO of the new company that we dropped the industries and called the Kansas City Southern. It was a railroad holding company with investments in uh, United States, Mexico, and Panama. And uh, that four years uh, that he served on the board was a very, very tough time. There were many days uh, that I wasn't sure that the company was going to survive, but we laid all the groundwork, and from there on, then the company uh, began to uh, get stable when we took over uh, the ownership of the concession in Mexico in 2005, and so things began to uh, move. Uh, ahead. So when uh, when Steve called me, he said, you know, he said, uh, Mick, this event is on April the 13th, and 13 is uh, your lucky number. Uh, so uh, you got to make sure that uh, you get the medal at this uh, event. And so you might wonder how is 13 a lucky number for a Irish guy, you know, that's uh, very superstitious about things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the reason is, I said that uh, when we spun off the financial assets of the uh, company, that was on July 13 of 2000. So 713 is not really lucky numbers for an Irish guy. And during the first few years, uh, I began to wonder if uh, 
it really was uh, going to be able to survive. But once we took over control of Mexico in 2006, uh, when I got to the uh, point uh, in 2013 when I was getting ready to step down as an executive of the company, uh, I decided that uh, 13 was going to be my lucky number. So I put in my email address, havertymick13 at gmail.com. So, <laughs> so anyway, that, uh, uh, that became my uh, lucky number. And so uh, why was it so lucky? I will tell you that back on uh, July 13 of 2000, uh, when the company first traded as a pure railroad holding company, at that time nobody wanted to own a railroad. That was the dot-com era, and uh, we were the smallest one, and nobody thought we were going to survive anyway. Uh, so the stock price was uh, $5.75 and uh, 75 cents on that day, and the value of the company was a total of uh, $325 uh, million dollars. So uh, over a period of 21 years, that was the lowest that it ever was. And that's why in 2013, when I got ready to step down, things were getting much better. Company was growing. We paid down our debt. Uh, we were investment grade security and so on. And again, that's why I uh, chose uh, 13. So anyway, then in uh, 2021, uh, Canadian Pacific uh, made an offer to uh, merge uh, with Kansas City uh, Southern, and uh, it uh, is uh, going to uh, take place. In fact, it's going to take place uh, uh, tomorrow. And so they paid the shareholders uh, for every share of Kansas City Southern stock uh, $300 a share, and the uh, enterprise value of what they paid for the company was $31 billion. So. Uh, <laughs> So now you can understand why uh, 13 is, uh, is, is certainly my lucky number. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to the uh, next speaker. And uh, I want to again thank all of you uh, for uh, being here. Uh, this is just a great honor. Uh, Byron Thompson truly was a great businessman, great family man, very religious, as I said, and he was one of my true idols, and he and I remained friends right up until he passed on in uh, 2015, and I always sought his advice on many things, but he was a great man, so I am very truly honored to be able to get this award. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, Mick, let me just say, I, I know my dad is looking down from heaven and he's got a big smile on his face right now. And he did cherish the relationship and your friendship, both professionally and personal. It meant a lot to him. And I didn't know all the details that you just shared about Kansas City Southern at the time and the difficulties it may have been going through at the time that you shepherded them through so successfully. But uh, I, knew, I do know this, I know that my dad enjoyed that experience immensely. and. Uh, he, he was always a person, you know, he would say, you got to learn something new every day. And so I know he enjoyed that experience because he learned a lot from it. But I also know he enjoyed it because of the association with you. And thank you for your kind words about him. You know, 13 was kind of a lucky number for, I'd say, our family, too. You know, we have 11 kids plus mom and dad. That makes 13. So, <laughs> you know, it's not bad. And, uh, in fact, uh, we're uh, dating myself a little bit here, but some of you may recall the age of CB radios. And so our family's handle was the Banker's Dozen. Um, so, yeah, let that sit in there for a second. Yeah. Anyway, so you, uh, you honor us as well, Mick, in, in accepting it. And uh, thank you for your kind and thoughtful words about my dad, who we miss, and, and, and just in a... In a fantastic person and we, we feel privileged um, or I know our family to have been raised with a, a great great dad a great mom Jeannie and uh, so we, we, we uh, we're thrilled to I've and personally for me to have worked with my dad since 
basically getting out of college in 1984 has been, was, was, a, was a tremendous uh, gift. So thank you. And, uh, but now on to uh, our speakers Mick uh, uh, referred to here. And uh, it's my, my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Esther George, who I had the opportunity to work with and serve on her board while she was the president of the Federal Reserve Bank. And as a president of the Federal Reserve Bank, she led a workforce of more than 2,000 employees who supported the organization's role in national monetary policy, financial institution supervision, and the provision of payment and financial services to depository institutions and the U.S. Treasury. She joined the Fed in 1982 and served much of her career in the Division of Supervision and Risk Management. She began by becoming a commissioned bank examiner and eventually served for 10 years as the district's chief regulator. In that capacity, she was responsible for the oversight of the district's state chartered member banks, nearly 1,000 bank and, and bank financial holding companies, as well as the bank's discount window and risk management functions. She was also a chair of the Federal Reserve System's Community Banking Organization's management group and served as the acting director of the Federal Reserve Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C. As president of the Kansas City Fed, she served on the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, which is responsible for setting monetary policy for the United States. In addition, she hosted the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium, which is an annual gathering of global central bankers, academics, and policymakers held in the 10th District State of Wyoming. After a remarkable 41-year career, Esther recently retired as president of the Federal Reserve Bank. That was a, uh, when you get to a certain age at the Federal Reserve Bank, it's, the, uh, it's a mandatory retirement. Otherwise, I would, she'd probably still be serving. She's going to share with us her insights on the state of the economy and other observations germane to the present economic situation. So we're pleased to have her with us here tonight, and I think you'll be fascinated by her insights into the state of our economy. Um, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions, so please take advantage of that. Just fill out one of the cards on your chairs, and we'll pass them to the end of the aisle where they'll be collected. So with that, now it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's key, keynote speaker, Esther George. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Paul. Um, <clears throat> what an honor to be in an event like this, uh, to see the importance of integrity uh, elevated here, and Mick, to see you be recognized for that. Uh, Paul, I want to also just recognize you and the Thompson family. Um, you did serve on my board. You brought that integrity with you, which is so important to the work that the Federal Reserve does. Um, and your dad was a special person, for sure. Um, I worked for Byron Thompson um, before I really knew who he was. I was, a, I was a teller, a gopher at uh, one of his banks in St. Joe doing whatever uh, they asked of me. But as I got to know him more later in my career at the Fed, what a tremendous supporter. Um, an example of leadership and uh, someone that when you offer this award, I can tell you firsthand, it, uh, it means a lot. And I do want to say, Mick, to you, um, really, what a well-deserved, well-deserved recognition for someone that I think has done more for this city than many people appreciate. Um, Every day in my office at the Fed, when I would look down at Union Station, I was reminded of how important transportation was to actually having a Federal Reserve Bank located in this city. The organizing committee came around and said, wow, this city looks like it is focused on the future. It is putting together transportation. It's a hub of commerce. And they decided to put it uh, right there. And you certainly have been a leader 
in your industry, your vision, your long-term thinking, um, and again, your integrity. So you are someone I want to thank for your support of me, uh, the role model you've been in many ways, uh, and I hope you and Marlis both continue to do well, even as you do good in our community. So again, congratulations. So my comments uh, this evening are gonna build uh, in some way on this uh, theme of integrity and in finance and economics. And I'll do that from the perspective of a recovering central banker. <laughs> I have been uh, away from the Kansas City Fed now for a couple of months. I do have to say, things looked okay January 31st. I don't know what happened after I left, but... Uh, <laughs> But there are many headlines today, um, in fact, frequent headlines that I think often leave people wondering what is going on, what is happening in the economy, soft landings, hard landings, will there be a landing at some point so we know the outlook. So I want to just put a bit of a wider lens on today's issues, thinking about some of the longer term implications of what's going on in the economy. And I'm gonna start with the event that we have now fondly come to know as the pandemic, the global pandemic. It really threw economies around the world a curveball, and it certainly did in the United States. When the attention on public safety, personal safety took center stage, the idea that we wanted to limit personal interaction uh, out of health concerns for the public really affected our economy in ways that we did not understand and I think probably today continue to live with and will for some time to come. You saw the federal government transfer some six trillion dollars in total from its balance sheet to the balance sheet of households, businesses, state and local governments. And at the same time that money was moving into our economy, you had a Federal Reserve that went aggressively in easing monetary policy, back to zero interest rates, and undertaking quantitative easing at a rate that we had not done anything the likes of during the 2008 and 2009 crisis. So the combination of all of that money coming into the economy at a time when supply constraints were very acute caused there to be these extreme imbalances between demand and supply. And John, you're gonna be a terrific economist, philosopher, we could use more philosophy at the Federal Reserve, I would argue, uh, but you know well that when you get a kink between supply and demand, you get one thing, and we are living with that today, and that is high inflation. The high inflation uh, really uh, took the Federal Reserve by surprise. And it is a point today that um, has challenged the credibility of the Federal Reserve and questions about the integrity of the institution in terms of uh, what was going on, why didn't people see this inflation sooner, and of course what's happening with a very aggressive response to that today. I was in New York last week and someone said, well, but you had the best of intentions, and you can't criticize people with good intentions. And I immediately thought of a phrase that my dad would often say about good intentions, about paving roads to certain places <laughs> that uh, get you there. So I will just say, uh, of course, no one had any ill intentions in these actions, but there are consequences, and today we are experiencing some of those consequences with an inflation that is proving to be not transitory, not really temporary at all, but very persistent. And there are some reasons for that. Um, at the same time that the Fed began to recognize this policy uh, miss, it began to move very aggressively. If you think back to just one year ago, March of 2022, over the last 12 months, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates some 500 basis points, 
It has begun very aggressively reducing its balance sheet as a way to get ahead of inflation expectations setting in, as a way to get ahead of people beginning to think, oh, inflation now, three years out, five years out, which of course was the policy era of the 1970s when Paul Volcker had to take some very, very drastic moves to try to change that psychology for people uh, that embedded that. So there are three things I wanted to touch on tonight in terms of how I think this economic outlook uh, might unfold. There are things that I've said over the past year in many respects, and that is even as we've seen supply chains begin to get better, uh, the combination of very aggressive monetary policy still leaves us uh, with a 5% inflation rate that is well over the 2% that the Federal Reserve has targeted, is nowhere near being considered price stability, in, which is the Fed's mandate. Um, and there are a couple of things that I look at that I think will continue to keep pressure on that inflation even as the Fed tries to respond. One of those is continued supply constraints, and I'm going to focus on labor markets there. The other is thinking about how much of that monetary stimulus, relief money, is still out there and poses the potential for keeping demand uh, strong. And the last thing I'll mention is just looking at fiscal policy today and where we are with trying to um, understand how much federal debt the United States can manage before it begins to uh, be more costly. So I'll touch on each of those briefly. We have today really an extraordinarily low unemployment rate in the United States, 3.5%. In fact, I would guess um, that the feedback that we get from businesses in the 10th Federal Reserve District hasn't changed much. We're the number one constraint, the number one concern they have is finding people to fill the jobs they have. It's become a big challenge in doing that. And when you have such a very tight labor market, it creates some of these imbalances. And it is really extraordinary to see, after the past year of the Fed's rate increases, that we continue to have a very strong labor market. Still, nearly two openings for every person that would be looking for a job. That's an extraordinarily tight labor market. There are a couple of things when you look at that workforce to say, what's happened? What happened since 2019? Where did those people go? Um, and here's where I think you see some effects of the pandemic still with us. One of those is uh, people have left the workforce are people age 55 and older. We saw a lot of people retire during the pandemic. People either said, that's it, I'm gonna quit. The stock market looked good at the time. There were other ways for them to supplement. They had concerns about health uh, and continuing to work. And so we've really seen an unusually large cohort of people leaving the workforce for retirement. It's, it's interesting because we know we have an aging demographic what I had not appreciated until we went through this period was how many people that retire that actually come back and take a job of some kind. Maybe not full time, but they come back to work and we have just have not seen the numbers come back to where they were in 2019. So unless something changes uh, in a way that would cause an older cohort of worker to come back to the workforce, that will continue to be a constraint. The other thing that we see in that data is immigration um, is not supplementing our workforce. So we have an aging demographic in this country that we will need a workforce to be able to come in behind here. Um, if the births in this country aren't going to keep up with it, we historically have looked to immigration to help fill that. And we are down substantially uh, over the last five years or so where we were with immigration. So that, of course, will keep the labor market tighter. And the other thing that I find interesting is on the supply side of our economy, childcare has become a constraint. As capacity was taken out in childcare, and this was one of the first areas that we saw in the economy begin to shrink, begin to pull back because of health issues, that industry has not come back, and where it has come back, 
the cost of childcare has gone up along with inflation and you find that uh, people are making a decision about can I afford childcare or do I sit out? There are many other reasons that people aren't coming back into the workforce and you can go through surveys. They range for people that say, I just don't want to work to some of these issues that I've talked about. So having a tight labor market is really um, creating some challenges in our economy right now. And when the Fed pushes hard on its interest rates to reduce demand, it is a way to try to bring that back into balance. When I look out at what might happen with demand, of the money that went out to households, to businesses, to state and local government, we are still sitting on about a trillion dollar in excess savings in the economy. And we've watched for some time to say people may become more cautious and hang on to that, it would make the Fed's job easier as it raised rates to see that demand come off and inflation come down. And so far, people are showing a real propensity to continue to spend. And how that next uh, trillion dollars of excess savings uh, begins to unfold, I think, is going to be important. We saw the big shift of people spending less on things. Again, remember during the pandemic when you couldn't travel, you couldn't go out, people began to buy gym equipment, remodel their houses, began to put a lot of demand on manufacturing. Today we see manufacturing slowing. We see some of those sectors of the economy showing signs of in inflation slowing, but on the services side of our economy continues to be very sticky and very persistent because people are traveling, they're going out, they're taking advantage now of being able to do things that they weren't able to do over the past few years. So the question of how much more the Fed will have to do to get that demand with that supply constraint uh, back in order, I think, remains to be seen. The last thing I'll mention has to do with fiscal policy. And this is something that I intentionally did not talk about before because there is an unspoken rule between monetary policymakers and fiscal policymakers, which is you stick to your knitting and we'll stick to ours. And since I'm no longer bound by that rule, I want to just make an observation. It looks like this will be the 20th consecutive year where Congress will not set a budget in a timely way. We are halfway through the year. And we are looking out over the next decade the debt in the United States exceeding the size of our economy. Already we are seeing interest expense is poised for the next five years. Uh, to exceed some of our largest spending categories like defense and Medicaid. And for the U.S., I think people have generally thought that's not going to be an issue for us. We're the world's reserve currency. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of people demanding our debt. But I've never been quite convinced that that assurance uh, would be long term if we didn't pay attention to the integrity of how we set our spending relative to our expenditures. And we know in this country, I just got my red, white, and blue card. We have an aging population in the United States. The demands on the services offered um, are going to continue to grow. And so it will be important, both from a standpoint of interest rate policy, of decisions that have to be made about spending, and taxation, that those issues get addressed and that we not leave them for a next generation to have to wrestle with. So the state of the economy um, is in flux, I would say. The imbalances that emanated from the pandemic have not fully been resolved. I think it will take some time to do that. And I think particularly in focus, we'll be looking at the workforce in the United States. As the Federal Reserve makes decisions about how high it will push interest rates, how long it will hold them there, the job does not get easier. It gets harder. And the reason it gets harder is because to reduce demand means that that labor force is likely to experience more unemployment. If you look at the Federal Reserve's forecast, you will see that by the end of the year, there is an expectation that the unemployment rate will rise. And that, of course, was one of the challenges of the 70s and 80s that caused the Federal Reserve to pull back 
and not get inflation under control until it was too late. Um, my hope for my colleagues is they will see their way through uh, to tackling that important issue. So Mick, again, congratulations. It is an honor to be here uh, to address this audience. Um, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Um, and any other thoughts you have, uh, feel free to pass them on. Thank you. We'll collect the cards now, so if you've got questions and want to pass them down to the students in the aisle, we'll collect and ask some questions here. All right, I'm going to start with one that I read ahead of time so I can <laughs> and then catch up. Um, so as we are here at Country Club Bank, could you tell us a little bit about the status of the Fed now and its impact to banks, community banks? I'd be banks. happy to. <laughs> so um, the payment system in this country is one that continues to evolve. And when I talk about the payment system, I mean everything from the cash that you may still carry, some of us do in our wallet, uh, to other ways that we make payments today. And as you know, it will not surprise you that speed has become the name of the game. And technology allows payments to move more quickly. One of the things the Fed began to look at more than a decade ago is how many technology companies were beginning to take bank customers and say, you can run your payments on my rails. And the American public has come to expect, when I make a payment, I can trust that that payment will be sound, it will get to its destination, and it will do that in a secure way. And the Federal Reserve has historically played a very important role in doing that. We've done that for years in the check business. We've done that for years in direct deposit, in wholesale wire systems uh, that run money around the globe. As we saw this proliferation, though, taking place outside the banking system, it did raise concerns about the safety the accessibility of those payment systems and the pricing of them. And so the Federal Reserve made a decision that as it saw the largest banks begin to develop a real time, it's instant payments that settle as soon as you push the button. I'm going to give you an example. Many of us have used um, Venmo to move money. And you can push the button on your phone and you can see that it's going to someone else. But that money is actually settling on some old highways that we call ACH, or direct deposit. And so there's a gap there. And during that gap, a company like Venmo is holding your money. And it's one of the largest banks in this country, if you were going to compare it to a bank, uninsured, not regulated. And so the Federal Reserve decided it would provide this functionality that the public seems to want. That Actors like Venmo and others can take advantage of, where when you push the button, that money can run, but it will allow the banks to also provide their customers this facility. So that's going to be uh, launched this summer, later this summer. Uh, the Kansas City Fed was very involved in that work, uh, both with my role in overseeing the development of it, as well as a team of people there that worked with the banking system to understand what they would need to do that. So. Uh, continued modernization of our payment system, and we think it's important the safety, accessibility, and security of that payment system be up front. All right. Um, uh, digital currency, cryptocurrency. What does the future hold in terms of crypto and Fed monetary policy? Well, <laughs> that one's a little murkier. So cryptocurrencies uh, have been around now going on 15 years. If you've read the book Digital Gold, when Bitcoin was first founded, um, I think a lot of people at the time thought this will be like the tulip mania. This will be a flash in the pan and will be gone. Um, and it has persisted. It's had some problems. It's had some volatility um, in terms of huge losses. People have lost a great deal of money uh, investing in cryptocurrencies, and yet it continues 
uh, to have a life of its own. One of the things I hear from people that are quite invested in cryptocurrency is their lack of faith that the federal government will make the dollar sound. And so they're looking for other avenues to do that. Uh, some think of it as a new form of payment system, that you can send money across borders and eliminate some of the foreign exchange friction and cost. Regardless of that, it has been a risky asset uh, so far to look at. And you have seen central banks around the world looking at ways to take that kind of responsibility on as a digital currency. Uh, Sweden was one of the first banks. In a country like Sweden, people have by and large quit using hard currencies and they were looking for a way to make it easier for policymakers to understand how much money is in the economy by creating their own central bank digital currency. The United States is also looking at that. The Federal Reserve uh, noted a couple of years ago that they would look at a digital currency. Not with much enthusiasm, I would note. Um, a lot of people saying, well, the US should do it because China's doing it. And I will just tell you, China's motives, I suspect, are a bit different than what they would be in the United States. So I think it's something to go slow on. I think it's something to pay particular attention to what is the problem, what is the societal benefit that comes from this. And I think there's still more work to be done to arrive at that. You mentioned immigration earlier. How do we best prepare our immigrant population for the workforce? Oh boy, the hard questions go now. You know, there are, I think, any number of organizations, and I've seen them here in Kansas City, uh, that have worked hard to try to help with transitions. Uh, we saw a group of uh, folks that came from Afghanistan in Oklahoma where organizations, and that was business and nonprofit, came together to say, how can we help this population who had a variety of skills, some very professional skills, people that said, I'm willing to do anything, get me a job. And so they found ways to begin to help them with everything from language to assimilation. I think as a policy matter, though, for Congress, this has been a challenging issue for decades for the United States to really sort out how, how are we going to supplement workforce, how do we make sure that uh, we are able to assimilate uh, people that want to come to this country. And I think a lot of work needs to be done here. Given the acute issues we face with our workforce, um, I hope there'll be some uh, some answers coming before too long. All right, we'll ask a couple more here, if that's sure. okay. Good. <laughs> All right, you mentioned the U.S. dollar is the world's currency. However, other countries have reduced their reserve holdings of U.S. dollars and are um, making agreements to trade in other country currencies. If the if this continues, what happens um, to the stability and the value of the U.S. dollar? into our inflation. Yeah, no, I think, I think we have to constantly remember that the role the dollar plays today was one that was earned. It is not one that is granted to a country uh, just by virtue of uh, who they are. There are many things about that. I mean, you think about things that accrued to the U.S. having the size of economy were things like rule of law things that caused people to have confidence in the country to do that. And I would argue that exists today. I see some of these packs forming. I see a lot of interest in trying to unseat uh, the dollar as a mechanism for trade. But I'd be hard pressed, just based on the interactions I've had with people around the country, to find people that would say, yep, I'm willing to put my hard-earned money in this country versus the United States. So again, I don't take that for granted. I think the U.S. will have to continue to address its issues, its fiscal issues for sure, thinking about how rule of law works in this country, how we manage uh, to continue to be an economy that attracts capital. Uh, but um, 
It doesn't mean others aren't looking to unseat that in some way. So we've had a lot of uh, good questions here, but this is a little softer and a little bit more fun. What is your fondest career memory or experience uh, from your time? Oh, I had many. You, you hang around 40 plus years, you get, uh, you get to uh, experience a lot. I will just tell you, and you hear many people say this when they retire, such a privilege to work with a group of people at the Kansas City Fed, to work for leaders. You know, as a young woman in the 1980s, I didn't sit across the desk from many bankers that were women, but I worked for an organization that provided opportunities and created a culture in the bank of integrity, of opportunity. And that, I think, has been one of the most satisfying parts of my job, or to work with people that care about the mission of the organization, that understand the connection of what the Fed does in the communities that we serve. And over that arc of some 40 years, um, when I started at the Kansas City Fed in April of 1982, inflation was 7.5%. I got a mortgage on my first home at 13%. Um, and during those first few years, um, in my role as a bank examiner, I saw hundreds of banks closed. And I saw a lot of suffering that happened in communities that depended on those banks for access to capital. Going all the way through 9-11, uh, through uh, the work in 2008 and 9. But the constant, I think, across all that was the opportunity to work with people that really cared about the mission, they understood the region that they served, and they did that with integrity, which is a great theme, Steve, to have come out of your college. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And in fact, I'm, I'm going off script. They're going to punch me here, but I just can't stand. I'm looking at such a great looking crowd. Um, I wish you could see what I'm seeing here because what I'm witnessing is a wonderful assembly, an unbelievable assembly in this room, which makes me very proud, should make all of you proud as well. And it tells me that great things are possible when people of a common mind and purpose come together for a cause. Um, now that's in this room. Outside of this room, if I can just be candid about it for two seconds, there are those who would demean our dreams. There are those who would say, I disagree with you and I'm gonna shout you down. That seems to be very in vogue today. And there are those who would demand that we compromise. But the message tonight, if you heard it, and I know you did, was don't listen to them and don't do that. Instead, just do good and do well and watch all the pieces fit together. So, fun fact, tomorrow happens to be the 67th anniversary of our mom and dad's wedding day, yeah. So it got me thinking, how many times, I'm thinking about a young Byron and Jeannie Thompson, you can think about yourselves if, if uh, you're looking back at a life well lived or anybody you know who might be young right now going through it, and just wonder how many times the world told them, no, no, that's not the way to do it. No, 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 your dreams are too big. Ah, your aspirations, too lofty, not gonna happen. Here's how you do it, compromise. Go along to get along, you'll figure it out, you'll get there. No, that was never gonna be the answer for Byron and Jeannie and I suspect strongly for all of us gathered here in this room. Why? Because they were made of sturdier stuff. I can tell standing here looking at you, you're made of sturdier stuff. The pillars of faith that created a wonderful place like Benedictine College created all of us, created Byron and Jeannie, gave them that strength that they said, I can go forth and we'll get this done our way. Mick Haverty was steeped in that tradition. Hearing Esther speak just now, who would disagree that she was as well? And John, what an impressive young man you are. And that, and that applause is not just for you, but those, as you said, who helped you become who you are and the other young people who are here. Don't you think they're steeped in this tradition? Don't you think they've got that pillar of strength? I do. I've witnessed this. It's clearly informing the path that they're going to travel. So what I'm saying to you is the world got it wrong. This room, we got it right. So go out there and show them. Go out there and demonstrate it. And as St. Francis of Assisi told us, if absolutely necessary, go ahead and use words. Enough of words from me. I just want to say thank you again to everybody. And on behalf of the entire Byron and Jeannie Thompson family, uh, it's wonderful to share this night with you. Um, we are honored beyond measure by your friendship, your kinship, and your example of life, faithful life, living it every day, when it's not easy, when it's hard especially, but there you go. So let's all toast ourselves for at least the next hour in the next room over here where there'll be uh, food and drink, and after that, I don't know if the cops are coming, but we'll figure it out as we go. So <laughs> God bless you. God bless Benedictine College. Good night and thank you. <laughs>